tell me what any other group of 18 to 26 year olds, of 2,000 18 to 26 year olds is doing right now. What are they drinking? What drugs are they consuming? With whom are they sleeping? And you can, you can kind of go down the list. It is such a rare thing. You see these young kids, I mean, I see them as young kids now because I'm old, yeah. but the young missionaries go out and it's just good to know that they're in good hands and you have the resources available that they need, so. She goes to Ohio for one transfer. And while she's there, there's a Russian family and she teaches them in Russian and she's the only one on that mission that spoke Russian. And then well, she gets yeah. a transfer to, right? <laughs> in Ohio, yeah. And so Crazy. this thing happens all the time. Oh. My it happens gosh. all the time at the MTC, and so I'm sitting back going, okay. Welcome to the Third Hour Podcast, where we talk about church culture and real topics within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, like mission culture and mental health and missionaries. My name is Mimi Bascom, and I'm your co-host, joined, like always, by my co-host and husband, Eric. Hey, guys. And we are here, obviously, in a very special location, but also with a very special guest. We are joined today by David Grant. David, how are you? I'm so good. It's so good to be with you again. So also, good to see we, you. Should we say David, Brother Grant? What, what would you oh, prefer? You can call me David. It's just fine. Big Dave? Like, what are we going No, with? not not that. You can call me <laughs> Davey Wave. Just kidding. David. Ooh, David's Davey probably Wave. Good. All right, okay. Great. Well, David, tell us a little bit about yourself and your calling and what we're doing here in the MTC. Two years ago, my wife and I were called to uh, to a calling in the MTC and to a branch presidency. And there's 30 branches in the MTC, and so we're ecclesiastical leaders in, in one of the 30 branches. Wow. And that's been and been two years. And and then other than that, you and I have filmed together in the, on the mm -hmm. Star Wars episode, and so that's how we know each other. But it's it's really good to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting us. And if you haven't seen our Star Wars trailer for General Conference, it was years ago. It's like, how long ago was it? I mean, five years, something like that. It was so fun. Probably the best thing I've ever done. I was Ray. <laughs> you were Han Solo yes. in like this parody. It's great. So anyway, <laughs> we'll have a little bit of a different vibe for today's <laughs> for today's recording, but we're so excited to be here. Um, and so two years as a branch, what is your calling? I'm called? a You're... counselor in a branch presidency. Okay. And the calling is four years. Wow. So we're half, about halfway into it. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, if you could summarize it like in one word, how would you describe it <laughs> so far? Word. I'm going to say miraculous. There's just, we see miracles here all the time. It's, it's quite an amazing thing. So that's why you have the calling, not me, because my word probably would have been like tired. Or <laughs> tired. It, it, no, it is, it is time consuming. Yeah. It is taxing. There is a lot of work there. We're here on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights and all day Sunday. Wow. And there's work outside of that as well, where we have to prepare agendas and and sometimes meet with missionaries on the fly, uh, but it's 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 also highly rewarding. My wife has said she really doesn't want to go back to anything else. It's going to be hard for her to get released. Wow! Okay. Can you walk us through just like a day of what you do in your calling? So Tuesday night we have a general authority devotional, and last this last Tuesday was Elder Elder Gong, <gasps> and when they come, they're a little bit unscripted, and it's it's nice, and they they say. They relate it to missionaries. There's really a strong presence of the Holy Ghost. So we get we get usually get all twelve apostles during the year, one a month, and then it's seventies and and members of the Young Women's Presidency. We had Sister Freeman come wow. the week before, and we have a Sister Wright that came, and she was magnificent. Wow. And so that's fun. That's Tuesday and Wednesday nights. We do residence hall visits where we just make sure that all the missionaries are okay. There's not anything we can help them with. And then on Thursday nights we get new missionaries in. And we do a little bit of an introductory meeting where we'll sit down, get to know them a lot better and kind of give them instruction on what their time is going to be like in the MTC. Mm -hmm. And then Sundays, it's just all day. Branch council, ecclesiastical leaders council, and then sacrament meeting and priesthood meeting and Relief Society. They don't have come follow me here. They don't do Sunday school. Mm -hmm. They do sacrament meeting and priesthood and Relief Society meeting. And then they have an experience called the go and do which is they have two hours where they study anything. They, it, they're kind of guided. There's a kind of an area where they're suggested to go, but they're allowed to follow any direction they want to go. Mm. And, and so they have two hours of that. We have a review and then we're done and we head home and, and they have the rest of the day is filled also with what stuff they're doing. So do you only deal with English speaking missionaries or do you have several languages you're dealing with? Or? No, it, it used to be that they would have specific branches for every language and, and now they don't. And, 
the branch I'm in now, because we have had, this is our second branch coming in, and we have Spanish and English, and a bunch more Spanish right now than English, but that can flip. The previous branch had all the really tough languages. It had uh, Georgian, uh, Finnish, Slovak, a bunch of other languages Dang. like that. Like, and they're they're Did here they for a long time. They try to teach you some of it too. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know. I'm not the age to learn a new language, so <laughs> and all I've got is Spanish and a little bit of Portuguese besides that. But they they do come here and they learn that, and and so they're there they're here longer, and it's really nice because we kind of get to know them a lot better. But we have Spanish and English in our branch right now. Okay. And how similar to like a normal church meeting is are the church meetings here? The, I'm going to tell you the difference first. The biggest mm-hmm. difference is fast and testimony meeting is silent until someone speaks, someone gets up to speak because normally no in your world, you'd know babies, there's <laughs> oh, no little kids, yeah. there's no you know shuffling of chairs. And missionaries are riveted to what's going on. They're highly invested in learning and absorbing things. And, and, mm-hmm. and so, and when they get up to speak, because there's 50 or 60 and they all want to talk, they have to condense their testimonies to about one minute. And the testimonies are such high quality because they have to condense the thing down that's the most important to them and when they bear witness, it's an astounding thing. It's like sitting there, it's, this is so great. It's one of the really marvelous things. Wow. So it's, there's similarities and there's differences. The differences are they're all the same age mm-hmm. and, and they all are really absorbed in what's going on. That's amazing. I, I wish I could sit in at one of your meetings. You are welcome to invite me. I don't know if that's allowed. <laughs> I would love to invite you. I don't think I can. Okay. But I as understand. a bishop, if I were to have <laughs> had this calling before I was a bishop, I would have run testi- fast and testimony meetings a lot more like they do it here and said, mm. today, brothers and sisters, let's, let's keep our testimonies to one minute. And as many as you can come up here and let's condense this thing down to the, the thing you believe is the most critical about the gospel. Because wow. it's really magical what happens. Okay, that is so cool. And how many members are in your branch? Right now we have about 60 and it, it goes lower in the wintertime and the summer goes a lot more because mm-hmm. when they graduate from high school, they, they're on their missions. We have a lot right now. There's over 2,000 missionaries in the MTC right now. I think we hit yeah. a peak of 3,000, but that was for like one day because they come in on a Wednesday and they leave. Other ones leave on a Thursday, Friday. Mm. And so you get this wave, but we have about 50 or 60 right now, of five, five districts. Okay. Wait, that's great how obviously that's a lot smaller than a traditional ward. Yeah. Is the purpose just so you have more individual time with each missionary? Yeah, I think so. You, you want to you have that and you want everyone. They teach micro lessons for priests and meeting and relief society. It's about a five minute thing where they stand up and they give their part of it. If we had mm-hmm. a ward or a branch full of 100, peop- 100 people, there would be not much ability for lots of missionaries to participate in that kind of a meeting. That makes sense. That's cool. Um, and I'm just like trying to soak it in because obviously I didn't serve a mission. But Eric, I wanted to ask you, you were here 10 years ago? Yeah, like it's how, been 10 years now. Does it's it weird. I mean, because obviously a lot of the buildings are new. So a lot of that stuff is different. But I mean, a lot of work the same way. Um, I mean, the big thing for me is I was called Portuguese speaking. So I was here for six weeks. So one of the the long timers. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a similar kind of thing back then. I, the testimony meeting was very different because we were encouraged to bear testimony in Portuguese, but we didn't really know it at all. So <laughs> it's more focused on trying to figure out what words you knew and that kind of thing. So it was a little yeah. different, but, uh, I mean, it was definitely all very similar to what he's talking about. It was just being very simple because <laughs> you couldn't not be simple with how little we knew how to speak. Yeah. Today, missionaries are encouraged, but not definitely not required. And many of them don't bear testimony. Most of them bear testimony in English, even if they're going Spanish speaking, but they can choose to do it and they do their best. And it's really not that great from a language standpoint, but it is from a Holy Ghost standpoint. The Holy Ghost is anxious Mm -hmm. to testify uh, and confirm their testimonies. That's great. And speaking of languages, do you know how many different languages are taught here? Oh, I don't. I'm going to say something like 40. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's I don't some... know if I could name 40 languages right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean the fact that they have Georgian. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah. And so there's there's a bunch of, of oddball languages like that. And there's Hmong. And I mean oh. you just there's some you could think of that are so so strange that wow, they teach that here. But I, I my guess is it's about forty. Do they teach Arabic okay. at the MTC yet? I don't think so. I've never okay. heard of any missionaries that speak Arabic. Because we had Arabic speaking missionaries in my mission, but they had to learn it out in the field because it wasn't taught at the MTC. Yeah. And I don't know the status of that. I've never I've never seen of that or heard of that mm-hmm. here at the MTC. 
Wow. Okay. So I feel like that's when people hear MTC, that's what a lot of them think of is like, okay, learning languages to go out into their mission uh-huh. field. But what else is taught here? So there are three things they need to come away with. This is a bit of a long answer, but I'll try to, I'll try to abbreviate it. They need to come away with one, an identity about being a son or daughter of God. And so one way that happens, so their, their, their identity is they're a child of the covenant. They've, they made covenants with Jesus Christ and with Heavenly Father, and they're a son or daughter of God by spirit birth. They're his children. And then as a missionary, identity is a missionary. One way to achieve that is they get stripped away of most other identities. For example, they're not consumers for the 18 months to two years. They're not voters. They're not sports enthusiasts. They're not athletes, except for if they do daily exercise. But they don't go play basketball games or you know the competitive basketball games. So you strip all that away, and and you're you're left with this concentration of things, learning learning what it means to be a son or daughter of God, learning what it means to be a child of the covenant, and so that's the first thing that they learn is they establish the establishment of an identity that's that's that important that will carry with them throughout their life. The second one is is they need to learn about the Holy Ghost and how the Holy Ghost operates, uh, the the identity of the Holy Ghost what the Holy Ghost is anxious to testify of, how to have the companionship, how the Holy Ghost speaks to you. So that's a really big one. And the Holy Ghost knows all things, has all power. And so once they get, once that gets absorbed and they really get it in their bones, it makes things much better and easier because they're able to understand and hear things they wouldn't be able to under, otherwise understand. Mm-hmm. And the third thing is they have an, a deep immersion. In fact, it's even a saturation into the Book of Mormon. As, as fundamental and primary. They, they have preached my gospel and they do other things, but their conversion to the Book of Mormon becomes uh, you know, one of the three most important things they're going to come away with. So there's a lot of time spent in that. So that first part, when you talk about kind of stripping away a lot of those worldly interests or that kind of stuff, what would you say to someone who's thinking about going on a mission but is worried about almost losing their personality in the process and not being able to have what makes them individual? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I've never known anyone who has left and come back, and if something is stripped away and they don't like it anymore, where they miss it, because if they if they get into a situation where on their mission, let's say they really like to do product thing X, which was kind of selfish of them, and all of a sudden they start to realize they really love the people they serve with, and they've fallen in love with the culture and everything else, and so now instead of choosing to go do that when they get home, they do something relevant to the culture. Uh, they might go to the Latino festival if they've served in a, you know, if you served in Brazil, I assume. Well, it's a long story. I was called to Brazil, but never yeah. made it there. Served okay. in San Diego. Okay. But among Portuguese, you, you might have fallen in love with people who who speak Portuguese and that and that culture. So you might go to the Latino festival you wouldn't have gone to before. You might have gone and done something else. But you don't miss the other thing. You come home and you adopt the new thing. And so even though it could change what you fundamentally like when you left, it won't be a negative change. And I think that's such a great principle just for everyone, every church member to develop is just how your self-worth or how you feel about yourself shouldn't be tied to anything that's not permanent. And the only permanent thing really is Jesus Christ and his gospel. And so when you look at life, you look at if you played sports in high school, your grades in college, whatever was kind of your thing or your success, I think it's just such an important reminder to tie your self-worth to the gospel because that's the only thing that's always going to be there. So Yeah, it's permanent, that and your family. And you don't give up your family identity either. When you leave, you remain son, daughter, brother, sister, whatever you remain. And if you're a senior missionary, you you remain a grandparent or a father, mother. And so you retain those things of permanence. That's a great way to put it. It's exactly the way I would put it. Awesome. And speaking of senior missionaries too, so we had that great talk in our most recent general conference. Was it Elder Rasband? Yes. Um, And he was like putting out a call for senior missionaries, which was great. How many senior missionaries do you have here? And do you have any in your branch or are they like in a separate thing? They're in a separate branch. Okay. And I would say there's 60 to 100 at any given time. Okay. And they come here for a shorter amount of time usually. Mm Mm-hmm. And, but they are wonderful. Every, and when he said every mission needs them, every mission does need them. And every mission is clamoring for more senior missionaries. Wow. So you put yourself in Colombia, for example, and your pool of possible senior missionaries you could have is small because you need Spanish speakers and people that can survive a third world condition. Mm-hmm. So, so, you, you, so the ones they get are just valuable. They're able to go into places and sh- have leadership things, work in the office, 
They don't proselytize like other proselytizing missionaries, but they're able to contribute in astounding ways because of their leadership capacity and other things. It's just a really wonderful thing. Absolutely. I thought that was a great talk and talking about like yeah. their experience that they can bring to the table from callings. And Eric's parents actually were called on a mission recently. So we're really were excited they? for Are them. Are they going to be here? I think they're coming here, right? Uh, oh, I don't remember. Unless there's no. an MTC in Africa. They're well, going to South Africa. There is one in Ghana. Well, I don't know. Are they going to MTC even? They're going to be serving the temple. Oh, yeah. Okay. They so, probably won't be going to, it won't be an MTC. Yeah, type I don't think thing. so. Okay. Oh, I feel bad that I don't remember, but we're so <laughs> excited and proud of them yeah. for going to serve a mission. And yeah. Just oh, so that's exciting. great. That's wonderful. <laughs> Hopefully we can too one day. <laughs> there you go. Well, my That's wife and I already have the, the mission picked out if they'll let us. <gasps> See, senior missionaries sometimes can have some sway in where yeah. they go. Not all the time. You can submit and say, I want to go here. A mission president can do a bit of a poll. It, but then you get called where you get assigned. You know, you, you go right. wherever they say. Yeah. My aunt wanted to go to Croatia because my cousin was serving as a mission president there. And she didn't. They got called to a mission in Oklahoma. Mm. And okay. You go I to mean, Oklahoma. Oklahoma and, that's and Croatia are about the same thing, yeah, right? The same thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so there is some pull in my wife and I want to end up in Columbia when mm -hmm. when I can retire, which is not for a while. But we we like you too. We look forward to that. Um, another thing we wanted to ask you was just about like a day to day life in, as a missionary um, who's here in the MTC. Like, what are they doing? Is their schedule really? Because I know on missions it's very regimented. Could you walk us through yeah. that? Yeah. So let's do that. And I want to make another comment about that, about what they're doing, because that's kind of important. So their day starts at 630 in the morning. They wake up, say their prayers, shower, brush their teeth, whatever they're going to do. And then they're going to go to breakfast and, and their class day starts after nine o'clock or 930 in the morning. I'm not sure that exact schedule on the morning one. In the evening, uh, they're going to come back. At, they need to be in their residence halls at 930. They need to be in their rooms by 10 and by 1030 lights out. And it's fairly regimented and, and, and fairly strict. They want to keep them on this thing. And if you think, what were they doing uh, even two months prior to their mission? How late were they up? <laughs> and it's midnight or past, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of an adjustment. When they first get here, it's, it's the, now they're waking up at 6.30 instead of 11, 10, you know? Yeah. Like some of my kids before they left. <laughs> it's a bit of an adjustment. But then when, it's, when it sinks in and, and they're fine and they get it, <clears throat> but I want to answer answer that the other question on what they're doing in a different way. I was here giving a tour with one of the lead journalists from Guatemala, and she and I are friends. So we took her on a tour, and as we're walking along, and she was just impressed with the whole thing. She uh, she kind of didn't want to go when I first brought it up, and I said, "Hey, our friendship kind of demands that I get to s mm, come on, you know, let let's go." <laughs> and, and I'm asking you to go with me, and so she finally said, "Okay, fine." So we're walking through here. It ended up being the best visit she had while she was here. And she did a lot of visits. She did BYU TV, which she really wanted to go see that, given that she owns six TV stations and eight radio stations. I mean, she's just really powerful. And we're walking along, and I said, okay, Elsie, tell me what any other group of 18 to 26-year-olds, of 2018 to 26-year-olds is doing right now. What are they drinking? What drugs are they consuming? With whom are they sleeping? And you can, you can kind of go down the list. It is such a rare thing to have, to have 2,000 people of that age, and they're all focused on... Now, I'll give you a couple things that are tough for them. The word guys. So we try to kind of get rid of that, and because they're elders and sisters, is important. the titles are really important. It's like you've been set apart and called by God for, and have this title, elder and sister. So guys is not something you want to do. But if that's the only problem they've got, if that's the only <laughs> thing, you know, they're struggling with, it's like, okay, this is great. Yeah. Because this Mission is rebels are funny. Game. Yeah. And I there say, was, guys, watch yeah. out. They say, okay, guys, and we'll, and we'll gently say, elders and sisters, you know, kind of like that, <laughs> kind of quietly, and they get corrected and they're okay with it. You mm -hmm. know, they, it's okay. There was one missionary who had a laser pointer and it was really annoying because he would, there was a, a general authority speaking and he'd kind of flip it to the screen and kind of hide it. And I'm thinking... That's so annoying. I want to find out who that is and take away his laser pointer. And then I thought, okay, if that's our biggest problem here at the MTC <laughs> today, you know, we're in really good shape. Go. <laughs> so, so you have to contextualize it. Got to throw that guy in MTC understand. jail. Take him away. Yeah, you, you know, you you really need to, and you really need to cut him some slack. I mean, they were in high school months ago. Yeah. 
and they were in primary not that long ago. I mean, yeah. we're talking about really young people that come through here. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of slack cut. There's a lot of love and there's an incredible amount of love and care and concern. I don't have any ecclesiastical leaders that I'm aware of who've, who are unkind, who, you know, they're just really good experienced, kind people that, that invest their lives in the benefit for the benefit of the missionaries. It's really beautiful. Wow. So speaking of the age of missionaries, why do you think it is, you know, such a young age that we as a church call, uh, you know, elders and sisters to serve? Well, President Hinckley gave a talk in 1995, and he mentioned the word callow youth because in an interview, and he even defined the word callow because I had no idea what it meant when he gave the talk. How old were you in 1995? You too. I wasn't born. One. You weren't born yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but that is so <laughs> crazy to me. <laughs> so you're really young. Okay. Oh, I'm really old. Let's say that. No, you're not. We're peers now. We're, hey, peers. we're, we're <laughs> old here at the MTC, okay? Oh my gosh. Yeah, yes, you we are. are. <laughs> yes, you look out there and you think, oh, they look so young, yeah, right? They're babies. Yeah, they're babies. Yeah. So <laughs> he got interviewed by the BBC and they said, what about this callow youth? And he said, okay, callow is unsophisticated, inexperienced. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's the beauty of it because they aren't tainted. They don't have uh, preset notions and conditions. That, like if you were to take a bunch of PhDs out of a university and ask them to go serve a mission, they're going to have to unwind and they're going to have to peel back. So they're not letting their intellectual or academic vernacular uh, taint the message of the gospel. And so you get, you get people that are 18 to 26 that are very sincere uh, and are close to the Holy Ghost. I mean, I think... Joseph Smith falls in the same category. Why couldn't you have picked a, a high-powered academic PhD? Well, because you would have had to undo a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he goes in believing that he can actually see God and he can get an answer to his prayer. And if you had someone with academic sophistication who had never had an answer to a prayer before, they're not even going to believe it's going to happen. So I think there's something about that age group where they come in with open minds and open hearts mm -hmm. and it's 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 beautiful how it, how it uh, how it matures and how it all happens but i think that's the reason what would you say to some critics of the church who would argue that the church you know taking youth at this age who are impressionable could be considered brainwashing them as i consider brainwashing i think the techniques and practices of it look entirely different than it looks here mm. i think when they teach it's it's more this is something to consider in fact the go and do experience might be one of those things where they're not directed. They're just said, hey, here's some videos you can watch. Here's some scriptures you can begin with, but wherever you're guided, you can take it. Let me give you one example of, of, of a, a sister missionary that get, we get done with the go and do, and I walk into the room where they were having this two-hour thing, and then we meet with them for a half hour after that to kind of rewind, and not rewind, but review what, they, what they've learned. Mm -hmm. And I felt something when I walked in the room and I, I said, whoa, somebody's had an experience. And she said, uh, it's probably me. And I said, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. So when, I, she, when, she, when we got started and she said, you know, I'm pondering the forgiveness of the Savior of my sins. And I was told very specifically, you have an unforgiving heart. You're holding grudges against these three specific people. And you need to not have the grudge anymore. You need to let go of that and forgive them because Jesus forgives you. And I'm like, that's incredible. Okay, show me the brainwashing in that. <laughs> she no longer has grudges against the three people that she had grudges to because she went through this go and do experience. Nobody told her you need to give up your grudges. Nobody tried to, you know, use a technique to get her not to do that. So it's almost all voluntary. The things that aren't voluntary are the schedule. And, and sometimes when they're learning in class, there's a few things that aren't really voluntary. You're going to be here at this schedule at this time and go through this thing, but there's a whole lot of free time to study on your own mm -hmm. and take it wherever you want to take it. And you can also walk out of here. Yeah. Some people don't make it through. They get in here and because of the rigor, because of other things, they just decide it's not for them. And they can go to the front desk and they can say, I want out of here and they'll book them a flight and they can leave. Mm -hmm. Nobody's trying to pin them down. There you go. People see the fence and they're like, well, they're locked in. You know what can you do? But yeah. They're locked in. Go, and, go to and, the front gate. They'll let you out. Yeah, and there are some strict rules. Let me give you one that's kind of like, you think, oh, gosh, that's really strict. One of them is they don't want their mothers delivering pizza to them. Like, they want missionaries' <laughs> mothers coming and throwing a pizza over the fence to their, their missionaries. The mothers can get them a pizza. They just have to go through the proper channel. 
Wait, they know. can? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you can you order can, cookies, you can deliver muffins and cupcakes. Yeah, you can deliver and, anything. Yeah. You just need to go through prescribed way to do it because cool. we don't want, one of the hardest things for missionaries is homesickness. Nearly mm-hmm. all of them go through some level of homesickness. Yeah. And so some get over very quickly and some have a harder time with it. And there's some tears shed because it's tough to be detached from your family to begin with so long. Mm-hmm. Missionaries that have been a year in college, they have an easier time. Missionaries that haven't, it's tougher. So if they're able to see their mother, what does that do? Is that positive or negative? If they're able to have, give their mother a hug when she comes to hand a pizza over the fence. And so they say, well, we, we, from all our experience, all our experience suggests that that's not a positive thing for a missionary who's trying to overcome homesickness. So right. there's a fairly strict rule about that. Doesn't mean they can't eat pizza. Doesn't mean it can't be delivered. <laughs> now, and they don't have zero contact with their mom either. It's just they not don't. through the fence. <laughs> they don't. And they, they can contact their mother on PDA via... So the rule is that you can do a video conference with your immediate family and grandparents. Okay. Anybody else, it's an email on PDA. Mm-hmm. They can read anything else, any other message anytime, but they have to wait to PDA to respond and to talk to their family. Mm. Okay. Tell us more about like what rules are set in place for the missionaries here. No like social media. Right? Yeah. They, okay. So no let, phones. let's get into that. There's a there's yeah. technology. Okay. Let me give you a funny one. They're not allowed to jump in the elevators. Like, okay. You think, <laughs> really? Is this a problem? And yeah. it actually is. Yeah. You get 15, 18 year old guys in an elevator. Right? They're going to jump. They're going to jump. <laughs> and they're going to see what it's like. when. And so you're dealing with an age group that likes to jump in elevators. And so we say, okay, there's cameras in the elevators. And guess what? You break the elevator, you're going to help pay for it. So please don't jump. So that's one of the funny ones. Okay. And, but it is an issue, you know? And so you kind of tell them, just let's not jump in elevators. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> and technology is one where they're, they have Facebook and that's one where they're not tightly policed, but they're highly encouraged to not sit there and scroll right. and to use any device they have or any, any social media they're on or any technology they have for missionary purposes and nothing else. Mm. And so sometimes we remind them if they, if they can't do it. And we want four eyes on a phone. If they're on their mm-hmm. phone, we want their companion to see what they're onto. And uh, of course, many of them, like, like any other group of, of 16, 18 year olds, they've done some things in, in technology that aren't, aren't really that great. And so we want to help them continue the good habits they would, they would develop on their mission here in the MTC and then throughout their mission mm-hmm. and then after as well. Cool. That's great. And tell me how those habits aren't going to help them like post mission too, you know, like waking up early, yeah. watching and being on social media with intention. I feel like these are all really positive life skills. They really are. And, and let's go back to the brainwashing question with that. <laughs> if, if that's brainwashing where they learn how to discipline themselves in front of technology, you know, really because that's really positive life outcome Mm -hmm. that they're going to have by being able to manage that themselves once they get off their mission yeah absolutely so i think yeah it's it's just it's just great all the way around yeah that's great well uh we also have an advice segment where we have people submit things that they are struggling with or we find some online we found this one on reddit and we thought this was the perfect opportunity to get your take on this so eric do you want to go ahead Sure. It says, I've been in the MTC for a bit now, and I've really struggled feeling the spirit and having a sense of belonging. Now, as for the reason of this, I'm not surprised of, and I've known for quite some time. I've always wanted to serve a mission, and my testimony is stronger than at any time in my life. I feel as if I have enough faith to move mountains, almost. I've never questioned my faith, and I want to serve the Lord my whole life. However, I left on my mission unworthily. I should have talked to my bishop years ago about a problem I had with law of chastity. I've had issues with it up to the day I started the MTC. It was easy to break it since nearly every other youth member in my ward broke it or the word of wisdom as well. I didn't really have my, many friends that wanted to help me keep the commandments. I feel extremely guilty for lying to my priesthood leaders and then being endowed unworthily. I just worry that if I confess now what others will think of me, especially my family and my ward members. If I confess now, I might have to wait six months to a year before going out again or worst case, I won't be able to go on a mission at all. This scares me the most. However, I know that if I don't confess that I will not receive the blessings promised to me that will help me in my missionary service and that I will be doing a major disservice to myself, my companions, and the people that I serve, not to mention the extreme guilt. 
but I'm stuck in this dilemma. I'm sure someone will say, just confess, it'll work itself out. And I believe that, but it's just hard for me to do. I've prayed for help and I know that's what I need to do, but I can't bring myself to do it. Any thoughts or suggestions are welcome. Yeah, some missionaries come in and they've had unconfessed sins and the Holy Ghost is so strong here that the Holy Ghost is continuously telling them, you need to take care of that. You need to take care of that. And Elder Holland mentioned once, if you have that kind of thing, unconfessed sin, and you try to teach the law of chastity, the words will dry up in your mouth. You won't be, you'll be a hypocrite because you'll be teaching something you're not living or you haven't lived. The other thing I'll mention is that the Holy Ghost is, is there's some things the Holy Ghost just loves and is anxious to testify of. One of those things is repentance. We had a missionary here who had unconfessed sin and the Holy Ghost was just work, working on him and saying, you know, he's, he's feeling all this guilt. Now, when he goes home, some of the members of his ward are going to unfairly shame him. It's going to happen. His mother or father might be disappointed in him, which is unfortunate. It, we should lovingly accept everyone that, that needs to come home from a mission and embrace them fully without any judgment. Uh, and so, but he, he, he decided he needed to take care of it. So he went in and talked to the branch president. He ended up going home for six months. And then he got, he went back out in the field. And I have, I have followed him on Facebook. So I know he's out in the field doing great things. He got together with the missionaries after he did the confession the night before he left. And he gathered them all together and he said, elders, I want you to know that uh, I, I had unconfessed sin and I went in and I took care of it. I have never felt better in my entire life than I feel right now because the Holy Ghost is so anxious to testify of repentance. The Holy Ghost will pour out a spirit on someone who does. And the relief is palpable and it's intense. And so they have to deal with the stuff when they get home. If they have good parents who are conscientious about it, the parents will embrace them and love them and accept them back in and just say, what can we do to help you so you can go back out if that's what you want to do? But it happens. But I can tell you that once they do, once they come clean and they say, okay, here's, here's what's happened, they're going to feel an overwhelming sense of peace and joy and hope. It'll be amazing what happens to them. So my advice is, yeah, you go in and take care of it. And it truly will work itself out, that the right things will happen and they'll be back on a path where they can progress and succeed. Otherwise, if they white knuckle at their whole mission, they're going to suffer their entire mission. And they're going to, it'll be just like hanging on for dear life and it'll be miserable. So just get clean, get it out of the way and get back. Go. Yeah. I mean, from my experience at a mission, just seeing different elders in a similar situation, the best time to repent and to deal with it is right now. So for this elder, it's right here in the MTC. It would have been better if he'd done it before, but doing it in the MTC is better than waiting till he's out in the field, waiting six months down the road, a year down the road, because you're just carrying that with you. I mean, it's just a kind of suffering at that point because, again, the yeah. Spirit's right there saying, hey, don't forget about this. You're not supposed to be doing this. What, what are you doing? And it's just kind of nagging the whole time. So it's like I, one of my companions, I believe he was about a year in when finally he was like, you know, I need to talk to the mission president about something that I did before. And I was like, okay, cool. And so he went and talked to him and, and he was finally able to get this resolved and just the relief that he felt like his whole personality was different because this was something that was just eating him up inside that finally he could let go of and was like, oh, I've actually dealt with it. Now I can let that go. So, I mean, it's just, it's sad to see this kind of fear and shame that people have because they say, well, there's going to be consequences, right? I'm, people are going to know I did something wrong. If I get sent home, if this or that, and they worry too much about the consequences, real, not paying attention to the fact that they're actually currently suffering, you know, yes. because of they're not, you know, confessing, they're, they're carrying this with them. So they're, they're too worried about these potentials consequences when they're actually already suffering because of it and that's actually worse for them yeah it's unneeded suffering and and it, it is true though i understand that there will be some people who will pile some shame on mm -hmm. and they'll look at them differently when they come to church for the first time when they get home and that's really unfortunate and that's definitely a problem in that ward or whatever if, if i were the bishop of that ward and i knew someone was coming home i may even get up in sacrament meeting and prep people and say you know, get after him up front and say, you are not allowed to, you need to wrap your arms around this, this missionary is coming home and, and love him. And he's doing the right thing. And this is a really good thing happening. I don't know that I would have said it, but I think that's one thing in my heart that I would have mm -hmm. is just like, there needs to be a soft landing for this. If something like that happens. 
Oh, and it just, it breaks my heart thinking about this missionary coming home and then having that experience with their ward or family. Like, what can we do? Like, what can members do to change this culture? Of course, just like be so loving and accepting, but is there anything, I don't know, like what else, what else can we do? It just breaks my heart, you know? <clears throat> I'm going to answer that with a question, with an answer that you're going to kind of say, well, that how does that follow? And it's, they need to immerse themselves in the Book of Mormon. Here's the reason. If you cannot read the accounts of Alma the Younger and the Sons of Mosiah, I mean, here, here's, what, here's what it says in the account of the Book of Mormon. They were the vilest of sinners. And yet, now, if you take the word vilest, what does that mean? Well, I can think of a lot of vile things. <laughs> and if they were the vilest of sinners, they exceed King Noah and they exceed Korahor. And they, you know, we're talking here a level of depravity and of, of sin that's pretty high, right? Mm -hmm and they became the greatest missionaries the church has ever seen. And so if people can absorb that and get in their bones, these, these Book of Mormon narratives of this kind of thing, then they'll say, okay, maybe he was a vile sinner, but he could also end up being an Alma the Younger or a son of Mosiah. And so, mm -hmm. wow, I'm in the presence of some greatness here if he chooses to take that path. So I think the Book of Mormon is the answer. That ab complete absorption for members of the church, it kind of takes away all that kind of uh, shame that you might, because you learn it from the world. You don't learn that from the gospel. You right. learn shame from the world and from other people. You sure don't learn it from Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so if you're, if you're really into what his gospel and what he teaches, you're not going to do that. Oh, that's such a great distinction. That church culture, negative church culture does not come from Jesus. It comes from the world. And I mean, it's probably just a consequence of being in the world. It happens. But I think if we do what you say, you know, follow the Book of Mormon, follow Christ, we can get rid of that negativity. So that's yeah. great. I want to get more into mental health with missionaries. So Walk me through. We talked a little bit about homesickness, um, but what are some other challenges that missionaries may face when they first enter the MTC or enter into the mission field? Yeah, there's a culture shock because you have this set of friends and this set of things that you do during a day, this time to go to bed. You have a culture with your family, you have a culture, and then you're picked up, put into a different culture, a different arena, entirely different thing. And if you already have some depression and anxiety or something like that, it can throw you for a tailspin. Mm -hmm. And so here they have a ton of mental health professionals that can oh. help a missionary out. So um, we great. sent several people to mental health professionals that are available and said, all right, it sounds like you've gotten to the point where uh, you, you need some counseling and some help. And, and so it, it, it's quite frequent. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in my age, I knew nobody. Well, see, I don't think I knew anybody because I really think it existed mental health challenges and issues and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I think there was a level of, of shame or denial or something like that that isn't that, there anymore. And so now it's people are okay, comfortable talking about us. They'll come in and how, on their papers, they'll say, yeah, I suffer from depression and anxiety. Good for us to know. Mm -hmm. So then if we see some signs of things being difficult, we kind of get good at knowing when we need to send them to some mental health professionals that are here on campus. That's great. So there's people here. Uh -huh. Okay. They're professionals outside, but they come in here yeah. to do the to do the counseling. And there's also medical. I mean, we had one sister who had a really severe nut allergy, and somehow there was cross contamination with Brazil nuts in in uh, in one of the lunches. And so she flat out, you know, they had to really get an epipen after oh and really kind of get her out of a shocking thing. So there's and then they send people to the Instacare and they send people to the hospital whenever mm -hmm. it's needed, whatever's happening great care is taken taken to make sure missionaries are okay. And there's several health issues and mental health and physical health issues that come up and every attention is given to missionaries unless they hide it. If they don't if they kind of say I can manage this myself and we don't know then it's just like when they're home if they if they don't let anybody know. Right. But even if we can detect it when they don't say it, if they try to hide it, then we'll kind of bring it up and say, "Hey, how you doing? You doing okay and what do you miss about, you know, whatever it is, we try to help them out with that. So that'd be only kind of the branch presidencies that are kind of giving that help for people or, or also like the MCC teachers kind of be referring people? Or how's yeah, that? anybody can refer them. It's just like there is so much attention given to to them and in situations. So any teacher, anyone who sees them can either approach them and say, hey, do you need some help? And then a branch president is going to be the one that, re that refers them to a mental health professional to kind of do a, a first evaluation or screening. They could actually go to the front desk right now and say, I need to see a mental health professional. Done. 
it wouldn't, they wouldn't have to go to a branch president to get that done. Now the branch president would be alerted. It would be treated somewhat like a, a medical thing. So one of our branch president was out of town one day. We had a sister that needed to go to the emergency room. So my wife and I picked up at one or two in the morning and buzzed down to the ER and, you know, kind of was there with her and, and you switch off with other, other couples that do that. Branch presidents are mostly, they're on call 24 seven. Wow. So there's a lot of attention given to them to make sure they're okay. That is so relieving to hear. Like, you know, cause you see these young kids, I mean, I see them as young kids now cause I'm old, yeah. but the young missionaries go out and it's just good to know that they're in good hands and you have the resources available that they need. So. Yeah. And for the most part, it's, it's very, very loving. There'll be a few occasional ecclesiastical leaders will get so frustrated because something really dumb happens. <laughs> and Getting hurt on say, the oh, playing sports. <laughs> yeah. Or, you, you, if, they, if they jumped in the elevator, like you want to say, <laughs> what are you thinking? Yeah. Like, 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 you know, and then you just kind of say, hey, let's talk this through. And kindness prevails. And, and one ecclesiastical leader was this week. And she kind of felt so bad that she got after a group of missionaries. And she goes, I need to go home and repent. I was, I was <laughs> kind of unkind. And I had a hard day anyway. And then I get, you know, they're imperfect. But they really have their hearts in the right place. And they love these missionaries. And there's something about the Holy Ghost. Like, we'll get a list of missionaries coming into the MTC a couple weeks in advance. Who they are. We see their picture. We see their profile. We know if they have a nut allergy or if they mm -hmm. put that in there. And they want us to know, then we know that. We start praying for them two weeks out. We look at their pictures and we occasionally, I'll just kind of talk to them, but without talking to them. And then there's this overwhelming feeling of love that we have for them before they get there. And then we see them face to face, we get in the room and there's not an issue because we just like, gosh, we love you already. And they hear that probably and they go, don't even know us. Yeah, we do. Because we really watch closely and we, we pay attention and we know where you're from and where you're going. And like a really lot of these missionaries, them. they're here less than two weeks now, right? That's the tough part. One of the things, because you don't get to know them as well as you would like. Now, that there's exceptions to that. There was one particular English district that left two months ago. And I still communicate with them on at least a weekly basis. Most of them, because there was such an attachment when we, we became so close as I would review with them certain things and teach priesthood meeting or something like that. And I was just in love with them. And, and there were miracles occurring around them that were just amazing. In fact, you really like to get to a couple of them. Yes, I mean, tell us more about the okay. miracles. As sister gets called to Finland, she already knows a big chunk of Finnish. I believe her, her grandfather's Finnish. Finnish is the toughest language taught here. It used to be Navajo, but they don't teach that here anymore. That's kind of a dying language. So she, she knew quite a bit of Finnish. And while she's here, she decides, I kind of want to learn Russian. So she starts to, she goes to the, the bookstore to pick up a Book of Mormon in Russian. She's looking at it. And there was one missionary in line that was learning Russian. He was the only one learning Russian in the whole area. And he said, hey, are you learning Russian? And she said, yeah. And he gave her a bunch of tips, gave her a bunch of books. And so she's starting to study Russian. She gets asked and gets permission to study Russian because she's so far ahead of everybody else that's studying Finnish. Mm -hmm. So then she gets reassigned. Reassignments here happen all the time. There's visa waiting. There's just issues. So she didn't get her visa to Finland. She gets reassigned to Ohio and she's really put out about it and beside herself and she said an apostle of god called me to finland i need to be in finland i don't need to be in ohio she's sitting in relief society and a, a phrase comes into her head there i will endow you with power from on high i'll endow you with power from on high and so she keeps this phrase keeps going through her head and she's thinking why is this phrase going through my head so she gets into her own study with her companion and she looks up endowed with power from on high and a scripture in the doctrine and covenants comes up and it basically says, I'm sending you to the Ohio to be endowed with power from on high. Well, it's so cool. She's, no, this is not the end of the story. So she's over the moon. And she's like, who's just, because I'm running in a room where we're at, my wife and I, and she goes, look at this, look at this, telling us this story. And she's so excited about it. And she's so, just so sweet and so smart. And, and then she, so she goes to Ohio for one transfer. And while she's there, there's a Russian family. And she teaches them in Russian, and she's the only one on that mission that spoke Russian. And then well, she gets yeah. a transfer to the, right? <laughs> in right? Ohio, yeah. And so Crazy. You, this thing happens all the time. Oh my It happens gosh. all the time at the MTC. And so I'm sitting back going, okay, and I'm used to it now. It was so shocking. 
I'll give you another one. And this one's, this one's great. And this was the English district I'm telling you about that I was just in love with. Uh, we had it, the, the district leader lost his scriptures. Great missionary from Scipio, Utah. Just a fantastic missionary. And he lost his scriptures here. And so he goes to the lost and found them. Well, they can't find them. And they said, hey, here's a stack of these quads. You go ahead and take one. And so he takes one and he opens it up. And there's all this writing in the margins. And he looks closer and it's not notes on scripture. It's notes from a father to a son. And it's saying, uh, Kevin, you were baptized today. And this is the story of the waters of Mormon. I want to tell you what your baptism was like for me as I felt the Holy Ghost during your baptism. All in the margins. My and so gosh. he shows it to his district. And one of the sisters said, uh, that's a family heirloom. You can't have that. <laughs> and so yeah. they open more and they're searching through, searching through, looking at all the writing in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures. And it, they find out a last name. But they don't know it's paternal or maternal because he said, uh, Kevin, Grandpa Davis was here. To, for your, you know, to, to see you after your patriarchal blessing and he talked to you about it and it was really sweet with the words he said, I want to remind you. So now we have an, a last name. Oh my gosh, okay. okay. Now we have a last name. So these, this sister missionary who's just so good, she goes, they go up to the front desk, she and her companion go to the front desk and they say, has there been an elder Davis that has come through here and Kevin Davis come through here? And they look him up and they said, yeah, he's in Milan, Milan, Italy. So he was here a few months ago, a couple months ago. Oh my gosh. So... Uh, she stalks him on, finds him on Facebook. Yes, and as sends she him should. a note in yeah. a message and said, "Hey, uh, we just found this scriptures here. Any chance it belongs to you?" And he sends her a note back and said, "I have prayed and searched and prayed and searched. I've gone to every single place I was in for the last two months looking for those scriptures, and oh. I just cannot, and I cannot believe it that you found these things." So they decided instead of sending him to Italy, they sent him to his home because it's oh. too precious to maybe lose in the mail. Oh my gosh. But things like that happen all the time here. Wait, I thought you were going to say then they got married. Yeah. <laughs> that would have made it even better. Maybe They're they... are barely out. On the okay, mission, then I maybe mean, this they still ago. will. Yeah. Oh my... No, no okay, you know would that okay. not be the best? I got, I got to tell you. <laughs> a two-year update. Let's see what happens. I even kind of... <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but I mentioned it to her. I said, hey... Maybe there's more to this story when you get home. <laughs> yes, yes, David. No, that needs go. to happen. But here's the, he, the important thing you said is when you get home, he did not say pursue this for the next yeah. next 18 months. Stay in touch yeah. on Facebook. Just not saying anything. <laughs> so, hey, after. you know, if something happened, oh send gosh. me an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> no, but even if they don't get married, like that's the most incredible story. I can't imagine like how devastated yeah, and I think they're going to end up friends no matter what. Yeah. Because for him to do that, it was a real rescue. Oh, yeah. And for him to, for her to rescue him like that, to give him that gift is just an astounding thing. And so I think they'll be at least friends forever. Yeah. If not more, who knows? When they, they get home, pass, we can see where it goes. They can pass the scriptures down to their kids oh, man. and their yeah. kids. It makes it even better. So <laughs> that'll that, be every time they lose yeah. the scriptures, they'll find their spouse, and that's how they continue the family line. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But there are miracles that occur all the time oh, here at the MTC, wow. and I just sit back and now, now it's like, yeah, I'm not surprised anymore. I love oh it, my gosh. but it's no longer surprising because of how many times it happens and how frequently it happens. So, what do you think? Because even just being here in the MTC, like you can just feel it feels mm -hmm. different. So what is it that makes the spirit so palpable? And what makes the MTC different? The Holy Ghost loves missionaries. The Holy Ghost. So there's a scripture in Moroni, or sorry, Moses 661. And it says, it is given to abide in you the record of heaven. And most people don't know what that is, but that's important. The comforter, which you know. Peace, the peaceable things of immortal glory, that which knoweth all things, that which quickeneth all the things, that which maketh alive all things, and hath all power according to mercy, justice. I'm not quoting it exactly, but I'm getting close. So the Holy Ghost is is uh, loves missionaries and loves missionary work, and is it, it's a testament to me for a couple of things that that's a testament to me that the work going on in missionary work is truly ordained by God because of the power of the Holy Ghost in this place, in this room, and everywhere on this campus. It's quite an amazing thing. Yeah. For anyone watching this who may be preparing to serve a mission, what would your advice be for prior to entering to the MTC and starting their mission? Saturate yourself with the Book of Mormon. No question. 
Number That's just one like advice. going to be your answer to every it's question. It's pretty we much ask. my answer yeah. to everything. No, Solves it's, all it's life's the problems. Right answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to get preach my gospel when they get here and on their mission. Mm-hmm. They can get into it early if they want. Yeah. But their immersion in the Book of Mormon becomes the most important thing that they can possibly do as they prepare. Mm-hmm. The closer they get to it, if they study in a tight radius around the Book of Mormon, it it has a power in it that is just just amazing, and it's going to get them through a lot of difficulties, a lot of hard times. You look at you learn about God's deliverance in the book of Mosiah. You learn about the missionary efforts of Alma and the sons of Mosiah. I mean, it's just these incredible scriptures. Can we just look at one scripture? Please. Okay, so there's one in Helam and 5.11. I'll pull that up. Okay. You're bucking the trend here. It's verse before 12 there, you know? You see, and I'm going to mention that. Exact, okay, and I'll mention <laughs> that. Let me pull this up and then we'll go to that because you're exactly right. And the fact that you know Helam and 5.12 does not surprise me one bit. <laughs> Mimi's not a, a scriptorian at all. I mean, I'm not a scriptorian either. I'll, but I'll know it when I hear it, but I have never yeah. been one that you can just be like, Remember verse. Alma 7, 27. Is that one? Alma 7, I mean, 27 is not one. Alma 7, 11, <laughs> and 12, and 13 are. <laughs> okay. But, okay. Uh, I'm not surprised. You have to look up, see if that's so, even a real verse. <laughs> <laughs> People know Helaman, Helaman chapter 5, verse 12, which is on, upon the rock of our Redeemer. You know. Oh, see? Saying. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Let me give you the verse before that. There are some, mis- some scriptures that are absolutely missionary scriptures. So when I read this, you're going to see it. Okay? Here's what it says. And he hath power given unto him from the Father to redeem them from their sins because of repentance. Therefore, he has sent his angels to declare the tidings of the conditions of repentance, which bring unto the power of the Redeemer unto the salvation of their souls. Who are the angels if not the missionaries? Yeah. And so they're here... They're here to learn how the conditions of repentance so they can bring people the power of the Savior. That is a missionary scripture. Yeah. And there's some that apply more to missionaries than anything. And and that's one that just has incredible power. That's so beautiful. And it's so true. I'm just thinking back of some missionaries like in previous words that we've known and they are angelic. Like they just have this spirit about them. So yeah. that's beautiful. I love that. Um, What about this? So some missionaries have a hard time coming home, like adjusting back from mission life back to normal life. So do you have any advice for anyone in that situation? Yeah, I'd say the number one advice I'd give them is to get a a calling in the temple, get Mm -hmm. a temple shift. There's a few reasons for that. One, there's incredible, they want to feel what it was like here. You go to the temple and you get just a little bit more. The spirit's really strong here, but of course the spirit's going to be strong in the temple as well. And if they get that shift, so here, here's something else. They can kind of fall back into old habits. And many of them who have had a pornography uh, uh, use or addiction at some point before their mission, that can happen after when their guard is down, when they don't have such restrictions on that. So if they have a temple shift after their mission, and it's, they have it on Thursday night, and Monday night they have free time, and they have the iron rod and the river of filthy water in the same hand, and they can choose which one of those two things they use. They, they apply the technology to. If they have a temple shift on Thursday, the likelihood of them using the iron rod on Monday is higher mm-hmm. because they'll be thinking about their shift on Thursday and they want to be worthy to have that temple shift. So I'd say that's the number one thing. I love that. There are other things I would suggest too, like if they stay immersed, I'm going to, okay, say it with me. In the Book of Mormon. (laughs) If they stay immersed in the Book of Mormon, it will have an enormously positive impact on them for the rest of their life. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. I love that. What about this? Another, we just need all your advice, but different answers too. (laughs) Not just the same. I won't always say Book of Mormon. You know, if all he has to say is the same thing and answer the questions, it's your fault for asking easy questions. (laughs) No, but I want to know. people who are coming home early from their missions. You know, sometimes it is for like worthiness kind of things, or sometimes it's injury or mental health reasons. Do you have any advice for people who may be struggling, you know, leaving the mission field earlier than they anticipated? Yeah, we go back to that shame thing where um, it it might be tough given the family condition or the nature Mm -hmm. of the family, the communication styles, the ward, their friends. It it could be a a really tough thing. Mm -hmm. And, I, I feel for that. I'm sorry that that's probably going to happen to some of them, and I wish it wouldn't. I wish that they would have full acceptance. There is, 
equal to a proselytizing mission is a service mission mm. and it's less restrictive and people can be graphic designers. If they have a propensity to be really good in technology and really bad in front of people, they can serve a mission. In fact, our foundation is a provider of service missions for people, and we, st we have some right now, that for some reason or another, they're not able to serve a full-time proselytizing mission for their own reasons. Well, some of them are going to come home and they can jump right into one like that. Mm -hmm. And they have a mission president, they have a uh, homecoming, they have everything else, and sometimes they can live at home and do it from home. So that's one of the options. Yeah. But they could continue to serve a full-time mission uh, doing that, and it's equal to, in the eyes of every apostle that I know of, to a regular proselytizing mission. There's nothing lower about it in any way. I love that. And and I love that. I feel like church and church culture is embracing service missionaries more, yeah. but I just love, you know, hearing, like having them talked more about because it is just as worthy as serving a proselytizing mission. It is. Um, so that's great. It's a great option. I think it's really cool because for a lot of people in that situation, they feel like, I mean, for worthiness, you know, it's easy to kind of point and say, well, your own decision led you here and that's why you're coming home. Right. But for issues of people getting injured or people getting sick, I've seen a lot of them, they still feel like they failed. Yeah. They think, oh, it's my fault. If I would have eaten a little bit more broccoli, I wouldn't have gotten sick and yeah, I wouldn't be yeah, coming home uh -huh. right now. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like these, the thought process seems kind of crazy, but they blame themselves and they feel like I have messed up this opportunity. I was supposed to serve God for two years and now I cannot because I did something wrong. And so I think it's so great that you bring up the opportunity of a service mission because it's like, well, that wasn't your one chance to serve. And even if you didn't serve a service mission afterwards, that's not your one chance to serve. This isn't your only opportunity to go and do God's work in your lifetime. Like that's what your whole life is for. So there's no reason to feel like you failed. You messed up your one chance. It's over because there are so many other opportunities to go out and serve. Yeah. And I don't know how many, how many parents are watching your podcast or, or listening to it. I know that you're, age demographic might trend a little bit lower than that. Mm -hmm. But parents parents can have a huge influence on how this works. If they're completely accepting of the child when they come home or the missionary when they come home and encouraging them to, if they want to get back out, we'll help you do everything we can to get you back out. And they can make the landing a lot easier. And, and that's what you want to do. You want to make the landing a lot easier and allow them to forge their whatever destiny they're going to forge. That's great. And something that even friends or siblings could yeah. probably help with too. So uh -huh. that's great. Um, is there anything else that you feel compelled to share and leave with our audience? I'm not sure. I would say that I have learned uh, so much from this calling. I know that uh, God loves these elders and sisters so much. So there's, you, you can know that God loves all of his children by calculation. It's a different thing when you get a spiritual witness that that's true. And so I was in, in, in Cuba a year ago, and I got the strongest witness of how much God loves Cubans. Now, I could have told you that already before I went there. I could have said, because God loves all his children and Cubans are his children, therefore, it's just like, you yeah, know, this deductive reasoning that I could, could have come up with. It's a different thing when you get a witness from the Holy Ghost that is true. He loves these missionaries. And by consequence, I do too. And if ever I don't, I'm going to be in the wrong and I need to repent and I need to come here with a full open heart and kindness and repent of my sins regularly so I can come here and be able to help them as much as I can. That's what I want to do in this calling for the next two years. Cause like two years down, two years to go. That's all I want to do for the next two years is, is love them so much that I can benefit them in some way in their, in their life, not just in their mission, but also in their life. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I can't imagine better hands that these missionaries can be in. So That's kind of you. Thank you for your service and thank you for this conversation. I had my eyes open just to everything more about like the MTC and missionaries. So thank you so much. Thanks, Mimi. And I have one last question. Okay. I have heard rumors <laughs> uh -oh, here about it comes. orange juice. Do you know where this is going? I don't. <laughs> I've now heard, you're going to sound odd. <laughs> this, well, this is what I've heard, is that you shouldn't drink orange juice at the MTC. Do you have any? <laughs> that, that, like when I was coming to the MTC, that was a, a warning that I got. Like my first couple of days, I said, hey, watch out. 
don't drink the orange juice. I have never, never heard that. <laughs> never heard. This that. was like ten years ago, so maybe Taylor, it's maybe Alex? it's maybe it's gone. Wait, yeah. Taylor's not. A, Where did that come Taylor from? Taylor knows. Okay. <laughs> I. I Where did that come from? See, the thing that I heard through the grapevine was people said a lot of people show up and they feel a little bit sick, and so they're like, "Dude, I gotta pound the orange juice so I don't get sick," <laughs> ah. and then suddenly. Now the orange juice machine is a congregating spot for all the sick people. <laughs> so now you start drinking it as a healthy person and you're going to come into contact with all the sick people. So you get sick in the MTC. Yeah, okay. I can, I can promise you that if chocolate milk is by far the most consumed beverage, I think here in the MTC, yes. in fact, there used to be things on how many tons of cereal they eat and, you know, and, and some missionaries come in and go, Hey, how about the food? And some of them go, Oh, it's great. Are you kidding? And I kind of wonder how their mothers cook. Just kidding. <laughs> do you eat here at the MTC? No. Yeah, I do occasionally. So I'll get invited. And other missionaries are like, Ooh, my mom's so much better. It just kind of depends. <laughs> and so if they invite me to lunch, like they'll have some kind of a question. I'll say, Hey, can we talk about that more? And I'll say, sure. And you know where I office. And normally what am I wearing? I'm in shorts and a t-shirt, right? You've seen me more in shorts and a t-shirt than anything else. And I hate wearing a suit. In fact, I'm so uncomfortable in this thing, I can't even begin to tell you. But I'll throw it on that day because missionaries have asked me to come to lunch and talk about something. And then we'll sit down over lunch and I'll just say, okay, let's open our scriptures and let's look. Let's answer your question through looking at the scriptures. And we'll do that for you know about an hour until they have class. And then I'll get back to my office as fast as I can, rip the tie and then you know, get back into my shorts and a t-shirt. Anyway, but, but yeah, awesome. so, so I do have lunch with them and I will eat here on occasion. So food, thumbs up, thumbs down, middle. I'm going to say it's, 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 there's lots of choices. There's different things you can go to, different areas you can go to to get food. There's one thing called choices, which is a bowl and they have this great noodle stuff. Like you can choose what you put in there, the protein you choose. It's good. Ooh. There you go. It's good. Okay. Then they have the Hawaiian thing where they have the you have three choices like, Oh, what is it? It's the pulled pork or the chicken or something else. It's teriyaki. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Then they have other things too. And always a salad bar. Yeah. So what is your least favorite food at the MTC? Ooh. Broccoli. <laughs> Just broccoli? I mean. No, I don't know. Uh, probably anything uh, fried. Oh, I'm okay. not a big fan, a fan of their fried food. Like I'll eat yeah, fried you're food. Super it just healthy, doesn't. So. It doesn't hold well, and they have to make a bunch at once, so it gets yeah, a soggy. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. And the, they think the potatoes are fake. I think it's the, the <laughs> potato pearls, you know. And, and so, oh, okay. And it's just so much easier. You throw yeah, a bunch in a in a, in a big it. mixer, and then you mm -hmm. mix it all around, and then you serve it to missionaries. They're not have tons of people peeling potatoes all day long, right? Because it would take. So I don't care for their potatoes either. But okay. other than that. It's it's decent, and I I like coming to lunch here, and I'll think, oh, that was pretty good. Nice. Yeah. Okay, final final question: <laughs> Do the general authorities eat here, and if so, what are they getting? They're getting like, catered. What is in. They're not eating Nelson's yeah, it is go to catered. meal. It's, probably catered it's catered from here from okay. BYU Catering. Oh, okay. But let me tell you about this this room right here. The room next to us, uh, all fifteen, the first president, senior, karma of the twelve, come here in in uh, one month of the year. Not for a full month, but for meetings when they train new mission presidents. Oh my god. And they gosh. have a sacrament meeting. And sometimes missionaries will get assigned to pass a sacrament <gasps> to all 15. And they're all sitting there. Imagine Can like imagine? tipping the tray, they actually yeah. spill some water on one of them. Yeah. But it's <laughs> well, in sorry, that, President Elsa. Yeah. It's like Telestial Kingdom. <laughs> it, it's in that room. And there's also a palpable difference when they come. Now, the astounding thing to me is having interacted with them closer, not so close that I know them personally, but close enough that I've listened to them when they're off, they're, they're off prompt. There's no, there's no, what do you call that thing? Teleprompter. Yeah. Having them do that and the amount of love and kindness uh, coming from them is just amazing. I watch Elder Gong Tuesday walk through that room because some it's so full now they can't all meet in the auditorium in this other building and so there's missionaries in here too and he walked down each aisle and shook hands and talked to people he is so full of love and kindness and he's he's not an exception when they come it's just a full expression of love and kindness and peace and joy and it's a wonderful thing to be associated with them can i t i need to tell you one more thing you and i know this because we have worked together kind of in the same space for a time and sometimes it's difficult. You look at what we, ha what we see and what we see in the world and what we see people that really want to damage the church. And so you have to wade through the muck and the mire. And so that can be disheartening sometimes. And you can kind of be low about it. You yeah. can go home and think, oh, that really stung. Or that really hurts. 
I come here, I've had more confidence in the future of the church than I've ever had in my life because of these missionaries. Some of them come in. So here's an interesting stat. There's a smaller pool now to draw from than there has been, yet there's more missionaries serving than there has been. The only Uh exception was when they did the age change and there was this influx. Mm -hmm. But now we're back down from that and we have been for a few years. So there's more serving now from a smaller pool than there ever has been. The church is healthy. And when they come in here and some of them are so full of life and love and spirit and they know so much, I think church is in good hands. I'm not even worried about it. And, And that's been another enormous blessing about serving here is to see whom, who, to whom we are going to hand over uh, administration, leadership, or anything else in the church, I'm not even worried about it because of how good they are. They're so much better, so much better than I was or anybody that was in the MTC at the same time I was. It's, it's an order of magnitude better that they're more prepared and more capable than, than we were in my generation. There you go. Now, I mean, that kind few, of goes back to yeah. before when we're talking about the age and how they're so you know, irresponsible and young and inexperienced, but at the same time, they can have strong faith. They can be prepared. They can have, yeah. you know, these kind of things where, yeah, sure. They're not these PhDs that study no. the scriptures their whole life, but that's not what they need. They need faith. They need to be committed. You know, that's what they need and that's what they're doing. Yes. There's a dedication about them that's unique and special and sweet. And so I just, I just love being around them. Well, what a beautiful message of hope. Um, just a reminder, if anyone's you know, feeling scared for the future or like looking around on social media, seeing what people are saying about the church, just like, just look to our missionaries and the good that they are and that they're doing. So thank you. Thank you. This it's been so great. fun to be with you again and so fun to have you, which you and I haven't interacted much, but... No, I think I talked to you probably at your daughter's wedding. That was about it. Yeah, that was about <laughs> it. So this has been really great to get to know you better. And it's impressive that you knew that scripture. That wasn't even the one I was going to read. That was really good. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for watching. <laughs> See you guys. See ya.